Well, tonight we will be looking at part two of our study on angels. I titled it Myriads of Ministering Spirits. If you were with us last week, you probably know that myriads, of course, that's where the, one of the title, part of the title comes from, the innumerable amount of spirits that minister for the Lord. Uh, and this is part two. And I mentioned, to try not to do this each week, uh, so we'll be in this just for a few weeks, and then we're going to pick up in Mark 11. Mark 11 through Mark 16 encompass essentially what we would think of as Jesus last week from his triumphal entry until the recording of the resurrection and stuff. So we'll return to that in a few weeks. Uh, But for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at this particular topic. And if you remember from last week in part one, I mentioned that most of what we know and believe about angels oftentimes comes from what I would say is pop culture, if you will. Uh, I use the expression, you know, or the example of Newsweek, Time Magazine, and all of those sorts of things. Someone who watches us online asked me, what does that Time Magazine say? In other words, the edition that it had up there. Uh, So I added it this week. If you notice, it says in the final bullet, 69% of Americans believe they exist, they meaning angels. What in the heavens, in the heaven is going on. And that's what the title of the Time Magazine edition was. And the idea there was, I mean, can you believe that 69% of people would believe that those things really exist? So in other words, the idea is somewhat of, I'm not going to say mockery, but it's sort of almost that way. Can you believe people actually believe that? It's just fairy tales, myths, folklores. And then we have the comic strip, and I will take this out after this time, but uh, you remember the comic strip. We get a lot of our, I call it hallmark theology from this. What does it say? Well, it's got the man up there who has wings and a white robe, and he's bored, and he wishes he had a magazine because he doesn't have anything to do after he's died. Now, of course, it's humorous, isn't it? But if you think about it, a lot of what people believe does come from those types of things. Either they're fairy tales and folklores, Or they have this bad idea that when such and such passes away, and I'm not making fun of this, but people grow wings, or they get really bored in heaven and they're sitting on clouds. We know the Bible doesn't teach that, does it? Uh, We know it doesn't teach that. But that's what a lot of people think, and the idea behind it is where are they getting their understanding from? Is it from here or somewhere else? And the answer is somewhere else. I'm going to read this to you. This comes from... Charles McCracken, and he comes, he's an author, writer for Israel, My Glory, and he writes this, and I think it might help a little bit, and then we'll look at our study tonight. Charles writes here, he says, A fascination with angels materialized in the 1980s, generating an innovative genre for television and movies. The public's growing interest spanned numerous books. And to meet the demand, sections devoted entirely to angels popped up in stores. But notice how he ends this. Unfortunately, most of the excuse me, most of the popular hype has little to do with angels, as described in the Bible, and often blurs the distinction between angelic and demonic activity. That's an elaborate way of saying, again, the same thing I'm telling you. A lot of people go to Barnes & Noble and they go to the religious section, which is really almost New Age mysticism, and they assume because it's got a label of Christian that that's what it is. Or they look at a far side commentary and say, that's what happened to Aunt May. Aunt May's up on a cloud and she's got a hope for a magazine. So that's the idea there, is we've got to, what do we know about angels should come from the Bible. And then when you and I know what it says, one of the things we'll see in particular tonight is they long for, as I said last week, the intimacy with God that only you and I can have when we are redeemed in Christ. They long for that type of salvation, that redemption that only humans can have. So more on that as we go through the next few weeks. Last week we looked at the existence of angels, and so this week we're going to look at the last piece of creation of angels. So we've looked at the existence of angels. We've seen that they are created beings. In other words, the reason why I mention that is we don't morph into angels. They're actually created for a specific reason. But there's one aspect that I left off, which is when were they created 
And uh, this is a little bit more involved, so I want to spend have a little more time so I don't want to rush this last week. And then we'll look at the nature of angels. In other words, what do they do? Uh, what, what are they like, if you will? Now, an easy way to remember the study of angels, and this is very overly simplistic, but really in many ways this is what it is. You have God who has created these holy, good, or unfallen angels. The myriads and myriads. But then, of course, you have the evil fallen angels. Those are the ones we'll see in the last study. We'll see some glimpses of it tonight, too, because it does overlap at times, some of these topics. But they rebelled against God, and they continue to serve whom? Well, the number third item up there, which is Satan and demons. And that is what the doctrine of angels really teaches, which is that God created an un countable number of spiritual beings we think of as angels. There is the group of them that rebelled along with Satan, and of course that's where you get into demons. So that's where a lot of that gets explained, and that's just a very easy way to remember it. If you weren't with us last week, essentially what we looked at with the existence of angels is what I said this way. If you believe the Bible, you're forced to conclude that angels exist and they're real. If you reject the scripture, then you can go wherever you want, but you're on your own because I'm not going that way. The way in which we take things is what the Bible says is what we should believe. In other words, what I'm asking you to do is, if you have a foreign concept of what I'm explaining, you need to be open to changing it. Because what we should always be open to is, what does the Bible say? And when the Bible corrects us, what do we do? Well, we change our thinking, don't we? And hopefully we don't have that problem. How do we know that? Well, 33 of 66 books, we know that angels are messengers. They speak and they serve for another. And we know that, of course, they're supposed to serve the Lord God Almighty. Remember the trivia question? How many? Well, you can't do a census, remember? They're innumerable, as the word used. Myriads and myriads. There's no census that could be taken. There's just an untotal number of Angels. We also saw in the terms of creation of angels as their created beings. I mention this again because that negates the idea of you and I becoming them. Because God created a fixed number of them. There'll be no more because they don't marry, they don't reproduce. It's a fixed number and so forth. And we've seen this, for instance, in Psalm 148. But God, of course, is the one who creates them. Yet in the New Testament, we have the more full picture in John and Colossians, which is what? Jesus brought forth everything that existed. Anything that came into being, Jesus was part of in terms of creating that, which is where you get into cults. You know, if you think of some cults, they think of Jesus as being the brother of Lucifer. Of course, the scripture doesn't teach that, does it? You ask a Mormon about that, and that's where they'll take you with who Jesus is. He's an angel, and of course, we know that's not true. So again, we need to know what the Bible says so we can gently correct people. But as I said, when angels were created, what were they created as? Remember what Ryrie says? Angels. They weren't created to become humans. They weren't created as animals. They were created as angels for a specific reason, and they were the purpose that God had called for them to do. Now, before we look at when they were created, you remember the definition that I gave you was first from Moody's Handbook of Theology, An angel is, quote, as a divine messenger, an angel is sent from God with a specific commission. And that's more or less what we typically see. Gabriel, Michael, what were they? They were specific angels who were called to do something for God. And what do they do? They do it. I love the obedience that angels have. They don't sit there and question. They're just absolutely in subjection and obedient to God, which is what we should be. But then notice Chaffers, and then we'll move on. He says, like men. And that's really what I want you to understand. Like men, angels have personality. We'll see that tonight. And are capable of great intelligence and moral responsibility. The idea there is they are not men, but they do have some similarities in that there are physical created beings, which is you and I, as I just hit myself, and then spirit beings. Don't worry, that wasn't the spirit of God speaking through the speaker. Okay, That was just my hand. Okay, I haven't turned Pentecostal on you or anything. Okay, So just calm down. But uh, now I want to tackle this one question here, 
And this question on one hand is easy, but I want to try to explain to you the more developed answer to it. The question typically comes up, okay, well, when were they created? Have you ever wondered that? It is an interesting question. The answer is going to be simple, but I want to show you the alternative view, which the alternative view is how do you fit it into a six-day a week of creation? You ever wondered how that would work? Well, I'm going to try to explain it to you, but let's start off with first turn to the book of Job, or Job, whichever way you'll help you remember it. So I'm sure the Roll sisters have the young kids calling it Job, but uh, all of our young kids. But I want you to turn here, and I'll see if I can explain this to you, because this is one question that just would have taken me too long last week, other than to tell you there's a very simple answer. You know what the simple answer is? Angels rejoiced and sang great praises when the earth was coming into formation. So how do we figure this out? And that's what I'm going to try to help you answer a little bit. But we'll develop that over the time tonight, hopefully. But in Job chapter 38, in verse 7, we're going to read, but we're going to read after I explain the context to it. I have always loved the book of Job, and if you understand what's going on here, it'll help you understand how the Lord responds. Job is pretty straightforward in the structure, if you think about it. What do you have? In chapters 1 and 2, you have Satan, who is in heaven... And he is doing what? Well, he wants the Lord to test his servant Job, right? Pretty straightforward. And he wants him to test him. And so God tests him, and he goes through all of those things in the first two chapters. But then do you know what happens? From about chapter 3 through about chapter 37, the people just, blah, 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 blah. they talk the whole time. Have you ever thought about that? Job's friends, they give a lot of conjecture from chapter 3 to chapter 37. I know we don't do that. But could you imagine being one of Job's friends and sitting around giving conjecture from chapter 3 to chapter 37 and they know pretty much what's going on. And if Job would just listen to them, they've got it all figured out. And God's sitting quietly upstairs as we like to say in heaven, isn't he? He's sitting up there thinking they have no idea in the council of heaven what really is going on. Do they? They think they do. So after chapter 37 comes to an end, God finally speaks after all that silence, after all that yapping from the humans, right? Notice what God says in verse 1 of chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, and you know you're in trouble if God ever speaks to you and there's a whirlwind involved. Notice what it says here. And this is God finally speaking, and he silences all of their yapping. Notice what he says. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? You know you've got to be in trouble now. Can you imagine standing before God and he says, Who are you to stand before me and tell me that you know everything? You know you're in trouble. Now read the rest. Now gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you and you instruct me. It gets even deeper waters here, doesn't it? But then he says, and he's speaking here of creation. Notice verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Question mark. Tell me if you have understanding. Who sets its measurements since you know? Or who stretched out the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? If God ever asks you something like that, go ahead and repent. Because you know you're in trouble, right? Think about it. So from chapter 3 to chapter 37, they've been given all these opinions like we like to do, right? And then God finally comes in and he just swoops in and says, you have no idea what you're talking about. But then what he's speaking of here is what? It's it's simple, isn't it? Creation. Were you there, Job? Let me ask, were any of us there when creation came in? All we can do is, in a sense, yield to what God has revealed to us, right? But notice verse 7, and this is where the angel's piece comes in with creation. When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. So what we know is that when God was bringing forth earth and creation, in particular the earth, what do we see here? Well, whatever these morning stars and the sons of God are, they praised and they shouted for joy when God was doing this. 
Well, we know that it can't be man, and I can tell you why it can't be man. Which day was man created on? The sixth day. So that creates a problem for it to be a human, doesn't it? I always love those people who try to say, well, you know, it was a human, but you have a problem, and it's the problem of Genesis, and Genesis says man was created on the sixth day. So how do we understand this? Well, it's fairly straightforward, actually. You'll notice I put up there this, and it sounds technical, but it's really not. It's called Hebrew parallelism. And that's just what it is. If you have a study Bible, it's going to say this. And what does it mean? Well, notice what I put up there. This comes from that Renald Showers book that I quoted, and it's a very easy way to understand it. It's two lines express the same thought, meaning in poetry, but through different words. We saw this last week. Psalm 148, verse 2, says that the angels and then the host of heaven were created. We know the host of heaven are what? Those are the angelic armies. So what he's saying is that one equals the other. And that's the way you read poetry. And so the idea there is morning stars, sure, could be celestial, but what most people say is morning stars equals the sons of God. So again, the question is, who are the sons of God, though? Because God didn't create man till the sixth day. Well, this is where we have to try to figure this out. And it's not really too hard. You don't have to turn here for this because I've already told you what goes on. But if you were to look... In Job chapter 1 and verse 6, and in Job chapter 2 verse 1, the same term is used there. Sons of God. If you want to study the Hebrew, it's called Bene Elohim. And I'll spell it. It's B-E-N-E, and then just like we normally think of, Elohim. E-L-O-H-I-M. Bene Elohim. This is the idea of spirit beings. Angels. Who was up in heaven before God? Two descriptions, Satan and the sons of God, and we know those to be the Bene Elohim. That's the angelic beings. Angels were always, if they're not serving God, they're in his presence. And so the morning stars or the sons of God are the angels, and the angels were singing praises when God was bringing creation into being. And that's what the Job verse is describing. What Job is being told there is you weren't there when creation was coming into being. The angels sang praises when the earth was coming into being. Now, when you stop and think about this, you think to yourself, okay, so I got that, but how would this work with six days of creation? Because that's the way I view the Bible. And I see that that is the way to read it. God created in six literal days. How then do we sort of fit this together? This is where I'm going to explain. I call it an alternate view. It's just a way to explain how does this fit into the sixth week? Because I can guarantee you somebody's going to say, well, see, that's why there's a gap of time and there's this long billions of years. Turn with me to Exodus, and I'm trying to explain this as best I can. Um, And you know, I always tell you, if I confuse you, just rewind and hit delete and just forget what I said. But uh, hopefully this will help a little bit, because I think it's not as difficult if we just let the Bible speak for itself. I think what typically happens is pastors or theologians or people like that, what they do is they try to explain things. If they would just let the Bible speak for itself, a lot of times it will take care of these quandaries, or we just don't know what they are and we have to leave them alone. And that's okay, too. But in this case, we don't have to. And I'm going to show you this. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. I actually think this is the verse for six days of literal creation. Because I can tell you, I have never had anyone who rejects it be able to really explain it. Genesis, they can sort of bob and weave around. But this one is very difficult. Because Moses uses the Hebrew word yom. And yom means what? It's a 24-hour cycle. And I have never, as much as I have read, ever read anyone be able to explain this who doesn't believe in a literal creation of six days. Now, notice what it says. So this is Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. For in six, this is Yom's, Y-O-M-S, days, the Lord made the heavens, notice it's plural, and the earth and the sea and is all that is in them. And what did he do? He rested. So it's very similar, isn't it, to Genesis. But I want to explain it a little bit more. So what 
Exodus is describing here in verse 11 is that it was six days. Yahweh made notice the heavens, plural. He also made the earth, the sea, but notice he filled all of them. One of the things to remember with Genesis chapter 1 is when God creates, what he does first is he forms something and then he fills it. Think of the week of creation. When God formed the sea, what does he do after he forms it? He fills it with the creatures of the sea. When he forms the sky, what does he do after that? It's not a trick question. He puts the buzzards in the sky, right? And so what is being described here is when the heavens were created, God did what? He filled it. God forms when he creates, and then he fills. And so what's being described here is that just as God formed the various aspects of the earth and filled them, so he does with his heavenly creation. And that isn't surprising, is it? He would, he would create the heavens, and then he would populate it with the angelic beings. This is exactly what we see, for instance, in Genesis 1, 1 and forward. You see this in Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6. I don't know if you've ever known this, but he speaks of it as well. We also know from last week in Psalm 148 and verse 2, what do we know there? That the angels were created by God, and when creation was coming into being, that was part of God's, if you will, endeavor was to create spirit beings. So God creates the heavens, he populates them, he creates the earth, and what do you think he does? He populates them. Let me read this to you and see if it helps. This is from that book. I know a few of you asked me about I'm going to bring it back because it's a quote. Renald Showers, it's his book there uh, on angels. But let me read this to you, and this is his explanation, and it's better than what I'm saying, but here's what it says. Notice what he says. It would appear that early on the first day God created the heavens. Later on that day he created the angels to inhabit the heavens Still, later on the first day, he created the earth in its undeveloped, uninhabited state. So this is pointing to that early part of Genesis 1. So again, you notice what Showers is saying. God forms something, and then he fills it. God formed the heavens, and what does he do? He fills the heavens. When he formed the earth, he formed it first, and then he filled it. Think about it. God's got to have somewhere to put the birds, doesn't he? He can't just leave them out there in limbo, so he makes the skies and so forth. So what you see there is a very simple one, and I added this to the end if you you get confused. The simple thing to remember is this. It's the last point. The angels of God rejoiced and they sang when earth was coming into creation, and that's a very simple way to see it. It fits into the sixth day of creation as well, as Showers puts it. Um, I think the other one says the same thing. Unfortunately, what happens is people will use that to propagate a gap theory. Does that make sense? Uh, I don't think it's necessary. I think you end up doing gymnastics with the Scripture, and there's no need to. The Scripture says God created the earth in six yoms, and you know what I think? That's what he did. He could have done it all just like that if he wanted to, but he took six days for his own purposes and such. So hopefully that helps if you have trouble with the topic I still point you back to his book. It does a really good treatment on it. But let's move on here. So what are angels like? What is the nature of angels? And this is a little bit easier, obviously, in some aspects than when they were created. Hopefully that at least helps somewhat. But what do we know about the nature of angels? In other words, what are they like? Well, you'll find that they are different than humans, again, Not as a negative, but just driving the point home here. So the first thing we know is that in Hebrews 1.14, that they're spirit beings. What are you? Well, you're a physical being, aren't you? Even when we die, we know that we go into the presence of the Lord. But what will we have for eternity? Do you know that you will have what we talked about last week? The resurrected body, that glorified body. That body that doesn't age, it doesn't pop, it doesn't crack which I told you isn't your house, it's you as you get older, right? Your bones pocketing and cracking. So we see that there. So they are spirit beings. In other words, that was the form in which they have. They do not die. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Luke 20, verse 36. Do you know what man's destiny is? It's appointed for man to die once and then judgment. Do you know that for you, if you are in Christ, do you know what you face in the future? 
you'll die and go and be in the presence of the Lord, or you'll be here when the rapture happens. Not so for the ungodly, though. But then we also have this third one, and this is the one that I think causes the quagmire in people's mind, which is notice what it says, sometimes appear in human form, and that's John 20, verse 12, for an example. There's a lot of other examples in the Old Testament as well. This one is that there were two angels at the empty tomb, and they took on the form, in other words, the appearance of a human. I actually think that's where we end up with highway of heaven and some of these other types of things as we have in our minds. Well, angels took on the form of humans, so what? That must be humans, right? But that's not the case. Spirit beings take on the form in the scripture of humans, but they do so, if you will, temporarily. It's a temporary state. Now, I do want you to turn with me to 2 Peter, though. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. So I want to show you something here uh, that I think will be helpful and remind you of a particular lesson. How many of you like to judge people? I know, it gets really, people start getting sweaty when I start asking that. But uh, this actually is kind of interesting. Uh, I'm really just somewhat messing with you. But in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 11... It says, and of course we know in the preceding verses that he's speaking of angels and those sorts of things. But notice verse 11. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. Angels are more powerful than you and I. Again, that kind of hurts our ego a little bit, doesn't it? We kind of like the idea of, well, we're humans and uh, you know, we're all powerful. But notice what it says here. Notice how powerful they are, but whose judgment do they leave to? They leave judgment ultimately to the Lord. Isn't that interesting? A being that is more powerful than you leaves judgment to the Lord. You know that's what you and I are supposed to do too, aren't we? We are supposed to leave judgment ultimately to the Lord. And sometimes people say, why is that? Because only God can ju- judge perfectly, righteously, holy, and he's going to judge one day. You and I just need to leave judgment with the Lord. The Lord will do and vindicate in his own time. Whenever we try to intervene, we get in trouble, don't we? So don't bring judgment on people. If the angels don't do that and they're more powerful, why would we? We leave judgment to God. And trust me, God's judgment will be perfect. But let's look at this next piece because I mentioned to you early that angels have P for personality, right? Isn't that what you teach kids? P for personality. Do you know that angels have personality? Personality means this. This comes from Charles Ryrie. He says, personality means to have personal existence. Commonly, these, these essential facets of personality are considered to involve intelligence, emotion, and will. The fancy way of saying, if angels have true personality like humans, they would exhibit intelligence, emotion, and will. So do they? Well, you'll find out that they do. First, with intelligence, you'll notice in the two passages that I have there, we won't read the Matthew one. Matthew 8, 29, we probably know from Mark, our time there. The demons... They asked Jesus, what business do you have with us before the appointed time? What do you have to do with us before our time of judgment? How would they know that if they weren't intelligent enough to discern it? Interesting, isn't it? Since we're close there, turn to 1 Peter 1.12. This is the one verse. Actually, someone asked me about this last week, so partly using it for that. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. And this is one of those ones where I'm giving this because I want you to see the intelligence. But if you ever have someone who says, you know what, I wish when I died I became an angel, show them this verse. And notice what it says. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. But notice the ending. Things which angels long to look for. Angels don't know the joy that salvation can bring them, not on a personal level. Angels can't be redeemed. Only humans can. 
Do you ever think about that? The angels long and desire for what you and I have, which is that intimacy with God, that redemptive, if you will, state. Again, I say this, why would you want to be something that didn't have that intimacy with God like that? They long for what you can have. Why would you want to forfeit it and go with what I call Harmark theology? I'm not talking about the TV channel. But you'll also know that they have intelligence, but they're not all-knowing. Only God is. Only God is, Matthew 24, verse 36, for instance. We know that they have emotions because in Job, what did they do at creation? Ah, they sang, remember? That's why I don't sing on Sundays, okay? What did they do? They sang, didn't they? They rejoiced. Why did they rejoice? Because they saw God's creative power and thought, this is unbelievable. And so they sing with great joy. Do you know another time they sing? Luke 2.13, I told you last week, at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, they rejoice with this high emotion. I'm showing you these because angels have similarities but yet differences. The similarities are that they have intelligence yet not all-knowing. They long for which that which we have, which is the possibility of redemption. They have emotions and they rejoice when God brings forth His work of, if you will, creation and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then lastly, we see that they have a will. Now, this isn't a will like when they die, they give an inheritance here. This is a will in terms of a desire here. 2 Timothy 2.26 and what we've already seen in 1 Peter 1.12. But turn with me to Jude 6. I'm trying to keep these since they're close by. But in terms of a will, 2 Timothy 2.26, 1 Peter 1.12, which we've already read. But let's look at Jude 6, because this will weave us into the last piece before we finish. Jude, and Jude is right before Revelation. Jude 6, and angels who did not keep their own domain, domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds and under darkness for the judgment of the great day. The reason why you know they have a will is because they rebelled against Almighty God. Interesting, isn't it? We'll see more of this as we develop it in the last one. But it's interesting here because God created them, we'll see in just a minute, as holy beings with the purpose of serving them. Yet what did they do? Just like Satan, they rebelled against God. And so we can see that they rebelled and some of them are kept in chains, eternal bonds, until the great day of judgment and they'll face judgment. And we'll deal more with this later. So clearly we can see here that angels have personality, they have intelligence, they have emotion, and they have will. In other words, they have the ability to, if you will, choose at least to some degree. Now let's finish this though real quick and uh, see this because this will weave into something later on and I won't have to go, we won't need to go back over it later. But the thing that I want you to understand is, and this is just the way to end tonight, is when God created them originally, they were created as holy beings. This is important to understand with the study of angels and sometimes gets lost. Have you ever heard of them called the holy ones? The idea of holiness, sometimes we forget. Holy means to be what? Set apart. When God created the angels, He created them as good. He created them for a specific purpose. They were set apart for Him and His glory. All those myriads were created for Him and to do His bidding. And when God finished the work of that week of creation, was thing, were things good? No, they were very good. And we know what happens after that, don't we? God's original intent, of course, but things don't stay that way, do they? Did creation stay in that very good state? Of course not. Even today we know what? The earth groans and travails until it's restored. Human beings do the same thing. They just do it in different modes. God created the angelic beings to serve Him, but they didn't all stay this way. You'll see this, and we've, we've kind of touched on this, but uh, a couple of verses there. Psalm 89, verses 5 and 7, describe them as holy ones, if you've ever heard that before. In other words, they were set apart for the Lord and for His purposes. 
But unfortunately, as you read up there, it says all angels were created holy, meaning in their God's original intent. They weren't sinful, and they were in a state of perfect holiness. So what happened? Well, we'll see more on this later, but the angels rebelled, some of them, against God. That's how we end up with demons and Satan. And, for instance, you can read Matthew 25, verse 41, Jude 6, which we just read. What was their original state? It was to serve God. What did they do? They, along with Satan, what did they do? They rebelled against Almighty God, and some of them are in chains even till today. The ones that aren't in chains, those are the ones we've seen, for instance, in Mark, all of those demons, that's where they come from. So what you see there, as I put up there, I've always appreciated this definition by uh, Lewis Sperry Chafer. He says, fallen angels are those who have not maintained their holiness. His point there is that they are rebellious unlike those other ones were. So angels were created by the Lord to serve him, and they were set apart for him. But unfortunately, they all didn't say that way, did they? So last week I gave you a reference, a resource material. This is the second one. It's by Moody Publishers. Uh, It's a a good one as well. Uh, Not that I put up a bad one, but it's a good one to read. It's uh, C. Fred Dickinson and its Angels, Elect and Evil. Uh, This one's put out by Moody. Um, It's good. It's a very good one. And this one and Showers are the two best ones that I know of because they stay away from sensationalism. Most of the stuff you're going to read is sensational in this realm, and that's not what we need to have. It's quasi-New Age, and we aren't New Age. We're Christians. So what can we learn? Just a few things. This first one is for one for us, isn't it? Like the angels, we need to leave the judgment with the Lord. I think sometimes we judge too quickly, and we want to make things right. God will make things right one day. Leave it to Him. This next one is one I want you to consider. There is a clear distinction between those who follow God and those who follow Satan. There's no middle ground, is there? There's no middle ground with humans. There's no middle ground anywhere in all of creation. You are either for the Lord Jesus Christ or you are against him. You can't be in between. But this last one is one I want you to think about. So they rejoiced at God's creative power, right? Do you know what else they do? They rejoice when one lost sinner comes to saving faith, Luke 15.10. So think about that. All of the complexities and beauty when God was bringing forth here, they rejoiced. When you came to saving faith, what did they do? They rejoiced. Isn't that amazing? They rejoiced when a person came to faith. Obviously something they could never experience, which is to be redeemed from a fallen state. And to be redeemed from a fallen state means to do what? It means to trust in what God has given to us and to believe. So when when one person comes to faith, what should you and I do? Rejoice rather than saying only one. And we sometimes do that, don't we? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for today, and thank you for the time that we've had throughout this day. Lord, I thank you for a time as we take a short pause in our study in the life of Jesus, that, Father, you have so much for us in your word, and it is true. Some of it we'll never fully understand, but, Father, I pray that we would take this study and consider such things as leaving judgment to you, because only you can judge perfectly. And, Lord, you will be the one who brings judgment that is righteous on the earth, Father, I also pray that we are clear that there is only one mediator between you and us, and it's the man Christ Jesus, Lord, that we either follow you or not. There's no in-between. There's clearly no ambiguity. We are either for Christ or against him. But, Lord, just as the angels rejoiced when you brought forth the earth, as hard as it is us to imagine, Lord, when one person trusts in your Son and repents, They do the same thing and they rejoice. May each of us have done the same thing. Father, I thank you for today. Be with us as we go through this week and help us to share the good news if we encounter someone who needs to know the message. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.